Hello, I'm Patrick Davidson. Welcome to Recaps. Today's program captures a fascinating conversation with Elena Brokaw, the director of the Museum of Ventura County, and Lucas Zucker, the co-director of CAUSE, which is the Central Coast Alliance United for a Sustainable Economy. So I'm going to ask you a couple of just basic things. Yeah. So what is your full name? full name is Lucas Clay Zucker. And did you grow up in Ventura County? Yeah, I moved here when I was 13. Um, so I spent a lot of my kind of formative teenage years here and then uh, moved back here after I finished college. What, uh, what brought your family to Ventura County? So my mom uh, got a job here at, the, at, at UCSB. And of course, Santa Barbara is super expensive. So, you know, we lived in Ventura. Um, but yeah, we lived before that. Uh, most, of my, most of my early childhood was in Oakland. And uh, my mom, was a, she was a grad student at Berkeley and, um, you know, single mom, grad student, so couldn't afford to live in Berkeley. So <laughs> we lived in Oakland. And, and, um, and then, uh, yeah, when she, she got a job at the, at the university, then we came here. Do you have any brothers and sisters? I have one brother, yeah. Older or younger? Uh, he's two years younger. Oh, okay. Yeah. okay. Is he still local? No, no, he, he's back in the Bay Area now. Um, Where did you go to college? I went to Berkeley. Okay. All right. So you're just up and yeah, down yeah, the California yeah. coast. Okay. Yeah. Gotcha. You know, the, the, the Bay Area and here are both kind of kind of home to me. But I think after I finished school, I really decided I wanted to be be here. And I, you know, especially doing like social justice work. And there's a lot of people come all over the country to go to the Bay Area to do this kind of work. And um, you know, it's kind of a cool place to be or whatever to, yeah. to you know be yeah. in the the kind of social justice uh, world. And um, but. But it just felt like there was so much more need for the work here, and um, this was an area that was really kind of politically shifting. And, and so, yeah, I decided to move back here. And I, you know, at the time, I wasn't totally sure about the decision, but I think now, in retrospect, I think I really made the right one. Okay, so we're going to move into social justice, and then yeah. so your work with cause. So, can, for for those who don't know, how do you how do you define social justice? Oh, that's a hard question. Um, I guess I would define social justice um, as yeah, folks being able to have equal access uh, and outcomes to a lot of the things that everyone needs in life. I mean, whether that's, uh, you know, a healthy environment, uh, you know, housing, a dignified job, uh, you know, education, healthcare, um, And I would say at its core, it's about power. Um, at its core, it's about correcting the kind of imbalances of power um, along the lines of race and class and gender that have kind of persisted in our society, you know, and our kind of legacies of all the things that, you know, is our dark history that we all share of colonialism and slavery and patriarchy and, but kind of undoing that, right? Mm -hmm. um, and being able to allow everyone to have, you know, some level of power and voice and kind of self-determination. So I... When I first met you, I think you had just come back from college and you had started working for a cause. Yeah. Was that your, have you ever had another job? I mean, have you ever worked for <laughs> another organization or agency? Yeah, I, I did a lot of work kind of, you know, when I was younger, different, you know, kind of temporary jobs and things and, you know, while I was in school. But I graduated from college and came right back here. I actually first volunteered for cause when I was 13 and kind of worked with cause a little bit throughout college. And so um, they really recruited me to come back to Ventura County. And that's, you know, why I'm, I'm here. Uh, and so I finished school, did a couple weeks of traveling and, and then, uh, and then came immediately back to Ventura County and just started, started day one uh, working cause. So I've been here over 10 years. Wow. Yeah. Well, thank goodness they did that. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay. So tell us about cause. It tells yeah. what it stands for, what it does, how long it's been around, just in general, for yeah. those who know nothing about it. So CAUSE is a community organizing work group. CAUSE is a community organizing group that works to advance social, economic, and environmental justice in Ventura and Santa Barbara counties. Um, and so when I say community organizing, that's really our theory of change, um, that we believe that the people directly impacted by issues uh, should be the ones to have their voices heard and be advocating for solutions. Um, that it's not, you know, me going, oh, I'm some smart guy who went to a good university and here's a chart and here's why you should solve a problem. But, but that it's farm workers speaking up about agricultural issues, that it's tenants speaking up about housing issues, that it's youth speaking up about education issues, right? And that our job is to bring folks together and, and get people involved and build their confidence and leadership and skills so that they can advocate for themselves, right? And, and so that's kind of the core of our, of our mission and purpose. 
Um, and we do a lot of different work ranging from uh, yeah, affordable housing to environmental justice to workers' rights. Um, I always say cause would be like 10 different organizations if we were in Los Angeles or San Francisco. Yeah, but, exactly. Um, you know, it's a, this is a more rural area. There's there's not as much of a kind of rich ecosystem of, of nonprofits. You know, there's, there's less investment in this, this community. And so we end up doing a lot of everything, but I think it kind of makes us stronger and that, you know, people live really multi-issue lives. And mm -hmm. so... You know, the same folks who are, uh, you know, impacted by issues in their workplace or impacted by issues at home or impacted by issues in their neighborhood. And so, you know, we strive to be able to address all of those issues um, and work on whatever people care about and whatever folks, you know, in that committee and, you know, in the in the city that we're working in, um, you know, want to focus on. So our, our base is predominantly um, Latino, uh, you know, from first generation immigrant Spanish speaking to youth of color, high school students. Um, and they select the campaigns they want to work on, and and you know our staff works to to provide the kind of logistical and and strategic and and kind of research and policy support to make that happen. Wow, you know it, it's interesting. At the museum, we're really trying to change the way that the museum operates in the community, yeah. and one of the things that we're working to dismantle is this kind of hierarchical mm -hmm. attitude. Just what you mm -hmm. talked yeah. about, where we're like, okay, here's the charts and yeah. the smart, yeah. Yeah, you know, and um, really involve, create, meet people where they are yeah. and create more opportunities for voices to come in. And you know what? It's incredibly difficult. It I is. mean, I know that it that is. sounds simplistic, but it's it's one thing to say, yeah, that's hard. It's a completely yeah. other thing yeah. to actually make a commitment to do it. Totally. And I will be very honest, like I just, sometimes I'm like, you know, it's just so much faster if we go back to the old way yeah. of doing things. It really is, <laughs> Absolutely. right? It's Absolutely. just, it, so, I, I, you know, apl I applaud you yeah. for you. doing that yeah. and for continuing that work. Yeah, I mean, those kind of inequities are so rooted in in our society, really like at the structural level, right? Where Where somebody could completely change their mind about everything, right? Everyone could wake up tomorrow, right? And have all ideas of prejudice kind of wiped from their brain. And yet all of the inequities that we yeah. have, they're rooted in all of our economic institutions and in our in yes. every organization and agency and yes. you know, just in the in the structures that we live in. And we could wake up tomorrow with zero prejudice in our brains and and be living still in that same level of inequality, right? Um, and it takes a lot of slow, deliberate effort to to kind of you know, unwind that um, and get people used to different power relations with each other, which I think is one of the hardest pieces, right? And mm -hmm. and for folks who have felt disempowered for so long, for them to build the skills and build the capacity and the leadership to be able to be, you know, um, part of governance and part of decision making, right? Um, and for folks who have for a long time had most of the, <laughs> whether political or economic or social power, to be able to step back um, and and listen to different voices and, and share power uh, is really, really challenging. Uh, <laughs> yes, uh. yes. Okay, so you said that you started working at Cause when you were 13. Yeah. So how did you how did you even become aware of it and how did you know that you wanted to be involved in that kind of work yeah, when you were so yeah. young? And I mean, weren't you playing video games? Yeah, well, you... <laughs> I was lucky to have uh, a family who, you know, my, my mom was very, uh, you know, involved in community activism and, and organizing. And, and so um, I was kind of exposed to those ideas really early on. You know, I don't think that's destiny. My brother, my brother works in restaurants and grocery stores, like he's a totally different path, you know, but, but I, I definitely had the opportunity to be kind of exposed to those ideas and, and, I, and those organizations. And so um, Marcos Vargas, the, the founder of Cause, connected with my mom, he, he told me, uh, or actually what happened is I, um, in eighth grade, I had to do community service for school and I was gonna do something typical like beach cleanups or yeah. something like that. And, right. and you know, my mom was like, that's stupid. You should yeah. <laughs> you know, do something <laughs> else, right? Uh, and, so, and so she connected me with Marcos um, and he was like, hey, you wanna come phone bake for us? And so, um, you know, he gave me a list of people to call and I, you know, I make a bunch of phone calls, right? Um, and that was when I first volunteered with Cause. I'll, I'll admit that um, I, like a lot of teenage boys, uh, was maybe not at the maturity level to be consistent throughout. Yeah, all okay, my, I, I, you know, I so, understand what you're saying, yes. So it was probably more uh, when I got to college when I really got more deeply involved with cause. Um, and so I um, spent one summer uh, interning for cause and then another summer running, uh, paid running the youth youth program at cause. Um, 
And so then, then after I was um, ready to graduate, then uh, Cameron, who was another one of my mentors at Cause, was making the hard sell to me to, uh, to, to come back to Ventura County and um, ended up here. So without Cause actually pulling you back, you don't think you would have come back to Ventura County? I don't think so. I don't think so. I mean, I, I was wanting to do political work. I was wanting to do community organizing. Um, and, and, you know, I also have roots in the, in the Bay Area where I went to school. And so, um, you know, it was exciting to be there. And then I think, especially there's always been, but, you know, maybe even more so now, um, this almost idea of like, if you move back to your hometown, it's like a failure, right? Mm -hmm. Of, oh, you kind of couldn't make it elsewhere. You couldn't mm -hmm. make it in a bigger city or mm -hmm. you, you know, um, and I think that was definitely in the air. And, you know, I think in some ways Ventura County loses a lot of really talented mm -hmm. young people to mm -hmm. who move to LA or the Bay Area or New York or wherever it is, right? Um, because they want to be in a more urban environment where there might be more economic opportunities and things like that. And so, um, yeah, I think if it wasn't for cause, there wouldn't have been that pull back here. And I think cause really, you know, made the case to me that there was there was so much to be changed here. And, and Ventura County was on this kind of cusp of political change, right, that that it was really kind of shifting and the demographics were shifting and the and kind of the political landscape was shifting. And to be part of that, I could be part of something a lot bigger than I think in, say, a, a bigger city where there were a lot of people doing that kind of, you know, social justice work, um, a lot of different organizations that that it was the work was more needed here. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know, I've been thinking about it a lot because uh, uh, while I work at a museum and one wouldn't think of a museum as, a, yeah. as an institution for social change yeah. or social justice, that is certainly where we want to yeah. be. And, I, you, you know, you live in the world and you see a lot of systems that are, yeah. you know, well broken or, or whatever, or have a lot of problems, and it feels so huge to try to tackle yeah. those things. And I feel like Ventura County is a size yeah. where you actually can make a difference. Yeah, it's absolutely. something about being just under a million, yeah. um, and we're we're big, but we're small. Yeah. And I really feel like, I mean, I know you've been here for 10 years, and they were saying it's on the cusp of change <laughs> back then, um, but I really feel like there are some things that yeah. we could actually do, just absolutely. a few people could do. Absolutely. I mean, it, it really feels like that. And, and um, yeah, it's Ventura County, is, it is an interesting place, right? Because it's it's kind of rural and kind of, you know, kind of urban at the same time. It's not so rural. Right. But but um, it can feel it can feel like there's an oldness to it. Right. Yeah. And there's a, there's a there's a sense of history here. Right. But um, it it has really changed a lot. I mean, even since I was I mean, since I was in high school and just the, the kind of political conversations that were going on in the in the classroom, right, versus what I see when I go and, you know, speak in a high school class now. I mean, it, it's uh, it's incredible, right? The, you know, the, the, the debates that were being had then versus now, um, you know, the kind of way people talk about, say, um, immigration and immigrants, mm -hmm. right? Or the mm -hmm. way that people talk about, mm -hmm. you know, sexuality, right? Um, you know, these are these are things that have really shifted dramatically in Ventura County, I would say, over the last last 20 years. And so, um, but yeah, it's, you know, it's exciting to, uh, when you talk about the museum. I mean, the museum's in the business of the production of knowledge, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Knowledge is power. And, mm -hmm. and um, that's often where it starts for people. Mm -hmm. um, and so we, you know, a lot of our work is around kind of yeah, kind of popular education and community education, right? Uh, yeah. So, um, that who is who is producing knowledge and for what, and you know yes, what stories yes. are being elevated is really important. Right? Yes, yeah. exactly. Especially with yeah. you know, you can go online and get so much yeah. knowledge that is is not uh, yeah. Yeah. true, right. Right? right? And so to both have a, a way to wade through and find yeah. a trusted yeah. institution that you can, yeah, you can go to. All right, so I wanna go back to a little bit about the sort of the non-traditional, um, uh, non-traditional yeah. hierarchy. So yeah. you are, I'm the executive director yeah. of the museum yeah. and I'm just one, but you're the co-executive right. director of Cause. Is this the first time that they've had a co? This is where the first co-directors, um, in some ways, uh, Maricela and Marcos, uh, who were the two founders of Cause? They they kind of acted a little bit as as co-directors, even though Marcos was the executive director. So I think there was there was a little bit of history there. But but this is this is the first time we've had a formal co-executive director uh, role, and it's kind of a a bit of a growing trend in in some of the nonprofit world. Um, and we wanted to try it out, and I I think it's been going really well. I think one of the biggest reasons for doing things differently is that a lot of executive directors burn out. Um, it's, 
I, I sometimes say it's the worst job in a nonprofit. <laughs> you know, you're doing a lot of fundraising, a lot of HR, finance, um, and you're often no longer able to do the kind of program work that brought you in to the first place to doing this, this kind of work and kind of fills your cup every day with that purpose, right? Um, and it's hard, right? And it's hard keeping a nonprofit afloat and all that. Mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. um, having co-directors, it, it kind of splits the load a little bit and also allows you to split the administrative work so that you're both able to keep, keep a little bit of a foot in the program. Um, and then I think especially as two new, relatively young, you know, executive directors to have a thought partner and kind of an emotional support buddy uh, is really important. And so um, I think it can be sometimes lonely as an executive director. Yes. Um, and so, yeah, I think it's a, it's a really exciting thing in terms of, in terms of the stain, sustainability for people. And then I think it also is symbolic of a, of a cultural shift of not wanting our social movements to be about singular charismatic mm -hmm. leaders mm -hmm. um, and to be more about collective leadership. And, and so, you know, I think that's one of the pitfalls of a lot of social movements you think of in like the 60s and 70s where there's like a single person you would associate of like an MLK or a Cesar Chavez or, you know, um, and, you know, frankly, took huge tolls when some of those charismatic leaders, you know, uh, were, say, assassinated or yes. were, you know, um, yes. you know, for, for whatever reason, lost, right? Yes. And so thinking of an organization more as this, this broader living thing that's not all about one person, right? Yeah, I love it. I'm going to have a co-executive yeah. <laughs> director. Um, <laughs> um, uh, I want to go to some of your, let's talk about a, a, a campaign that you would really like to share, that you sure. feel really great about. And then we're going to go to some of the yeah. challenges because, you know, success does yeah. not come out of nowhere. There have to be a lot of challenges on the way. So, Absolutely. but first let's talk about something that you, you're you yeah. really proud of and, and get into some details for us. Yeah. Uh, one of the first campaigns that I started working on was I was an organizer at cause. So I started uh, out of college as a youth organizer and research and communications back when the organization was smaller. You had to do multiple jobs, basically, right? Um, and I was I was working with youth in South Oxnard. Um, and Oxnard has always had all of the power plants for Ventura County, the produce Ventura County's electricity have all historically been located in Oxnard. And it's kind of this legacy of environmental racism, really, that's that's existed in our community for generations. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and they create a lot of pollution. And, um, and so there was a proposal to build a new one. Um, and a lot of folks in Oxnard were fed up of feeling like Oxnard had been the dumping ground of a lot of heavy industrial pollution that a lot of the other communities in Mentor County that are more affluent, that are more white, uh, would never have allowed, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, people were organizing and, and wanting to, to fight back against this. And I was kind of the, the main organizer on the ground at the time. Um, and people were coming out to these hearings. The, the, the state ultimately was making the decisions. It was like the California Energy Commission. Uh, you know, we had hundreds of people coming out to, you know, hearing after hearing. And it took, this took place over several years. And uh, we did everything from you know, legal work to, you know, communications and getting things in the in the news to raise the profile of the issue to, uh, you know, even did a civil disobedience. Um, and a lot of it was really led by, you know, these young Latino women in, in South Oxnard. And, and, and so it, they were taking on this huge corporation. So NRG, they're the largest operator of power plants in the United States. They were the one proposing this. And, you know, up against this working class immigrant town, a lot of folks who work in the fields, um, you know, kind of this David versus Goliath fight uh, that, frankly, no one expected we were going to win. And, and as we got kind of halfway into this campaign, as, as I really understood the stakes and I understood the, the odds against us, I, I actually was kind of full of regret. I was like, oh man, I, I've kind of like gotten this organization really invested in this fight that we're probably gonna lose, <laughs> you know, against this huge, powerful and, and wealthy opponent. Um, and if only someone had explained to me early on that, <laughs> that, that we were, you know, up against impossible odds. I don't, I don't know if we would have, you know, taken this on, but, but somehow we were, we were kind of able to turn the tide and, and through a lot of organizing, a lot of people power, a lot of willingness to kind of take bold action and, and kind of uh, raise the profile of this issue. And we were starting to get statewide and national media and people were kind of jumping on board and, um, and ultimately, we won, um, and we were able to kind of defeat this this company and stop stop that power plant from being built. Um, and it was kind of seen as this turning point in kind of California's like energy policy, where this was people were saying this was going to be the last fossil fuel power plant built in California. Um, 
And so it was a it was a really exciting thing. I think it really you know um, showed the power of the community in Oxnard and, and and the power of so many people who are involved. I mean, really hundreds of people who who made up this this campaign um, to yeah take on a possible odds and win. That is amazing. Yeah. What a great story. Yeah. And I like about the story um, uh, that there was you, you know that you were sure it wasn't going to yeah. work. And then at that point, you didn't know where you were that's in right. this whole thing, right? And that's, that's one right. of the things about living. When we look yeah. at history, we we know what the story is because and we can see it. There's a beginning, a middle, and an end, totally. and then it goes on again. But we have no idea where we are in history right now. Totally. We have no idea. Totally. What yep. point we're at. Yep. And it gives me, you know, it's like we were saying before, it gives me some solace because it can be hard looking at the at looking at all of the things that are not going great and absolutely. things that are going wrong. And but the story's not done yet. Yep. Absolutely. And often the pendulum swings, right? You you make victories and then there's backlash and you yeah. take two steps forward and one step back. But yeah, being able to take the long view in history and see your work in that historical context. Um, like I doing doing environmental justice work in Oxnard, I, I think of reading the book uh, Strategies of Segregation, um, you know, and it and in maybe the first chapter, it's you know, near the beginning, it talks about people in La Colonia in Oxnard mm -hmm. um, fighting against kind of the town dump being mm -hmm. put in their neighborhood. Mm -hmm. And before anybody really had the terminology of environmental justice or environmental racism or anything like that, one of the first ever really social movements and acts of resistance and acts of community organizing in, in Oxnard um, was about that, mm -hmm. right? It <laughs> was yeah. actually about environmental justice, right? Right, right, yeah. without the terminology yeah. Yeah. of it, yeah. Yeah, we, he came and spoke oh, here at yeah. the museum. I don't know if you knew that. Um, so do you, can you look back on that, on mm -hmm. the, um, the, the fight in Oxnard over the power plant? Can you see where the, where the turning point was yeah. within the campaign? Yeah. I think the turning point for us was really the willingness to be bold and do a civil disobedience. And we, we a bunch of young people in Oxnard really um, shut down this California Energy Commission hearing. Um, and so it was a little bit of, you know, people may not, like to hear this, that sometimes what it takes to kind of flip the table when the the kind of deck is stacked against you um, is a willingness to not play by the rules, you know. Um, and I think doing that civil disobedience is what raised the profile of the fight to be seen outside of Oxnard. Because I think the big problem we were having is the decisions were all being made in Sacramento. Right. And, and the people who care about it were all in Oxnard. And there was almost no visibility of the issue outside of outside of the community. And so once we did that, that was where it started getting, you know, the LA Times covering the issue on like a weekly basis. And it was it was starting to kind of pick up steam. And the president of the Senate, you know, got involved and and you know, there was there was kind of increasing attention and, and an increasing profile, right? Um, because the community was willing to be so bold and kind of put themselves on the line and say, you know, this has been going on long enough and, and you know, we're, we're willing to break the rules and we're willing to, um, you know, really risk more um, to, to show how much we care about this fight. That is because, and you know, I've worked with cause, um, and 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 cause has worked mm -hmm. against me <laughs> at, at times because I used yeah. to work at the city. Yeah. And my first experience with cause was um, the advocacy for a public park yeah. on the That's avenue, right. um, and the city leaders were not on board with yeah. it. And it, that would, that park would never be there without cause. That's Absolutely, right. one hundred percent would never be there without cause. And there's some other things that also wouldn't be there without without Kaiser and their sure. commitment to. Um, their, their zone funding that they put in. But um, it's always interesting being, so in that case, I was in the power structure, right? And it's, so it's always interesting to see, to kind of grapple with um, people fighting for change by fighting yeah. versus people fighting for change by trying to work with. Yeah. And I think that's what you're sort of talking about is yeah. that in the, maybe yeah. I'm inferring yeah. that there was a time when you were like, okay, we're going to work with, we're going to work yeah. with, and we're going to push this. And yeah. then finally you couldn't. Yep. Yeah. So exactly. you turn to a fight. Exactly. And I would say sometimes we think of it as, you know, fighting within the system and fighting outside the system. And I think sometimes it's a little bit of a false dichotomy um, because I think when you're only willing to work within the system and not willing to kind of push and fight, it, it really just allows kind of the existing power hierarchy to, to you know, be in place. Working within the system works when you're in power in the system, right? Yeah. When you have no power in the system, yeah. Yeah. you just go and make public comment in meetings and yeah. people will just ignore you and, yeah. <laughs> you know, you, you do your thing, right? Yeah. Um, but on the, on the other side, if you're 
you know, only there to tear things down and only there to, you know, kind of, you know, bang on the outside of the walls, um, then you're often never able to get to the point of actual governing power, actually creating programs and getting them to work and be implemented successfully and, and changing the structures that you need to, to actually, you know, fundamentally transform the system. And so um, what I often think of it as we, if you're representing folks who, who are disempowered or marginalized or have been kind of outside of the power structure, you have to fight to get to the table, right? And then you have to be very strategic once you're at the table, mm -hmm. you know, because it often ends in some form of negotiation. It's, it's rare that you're able to get the power to get everything you want, right? Mm -hmm. Um, but you're able to get to the place where, you know, for, for cause where we're able to get to the place where farm workers are able to be at the same table with farm owners, right? And tenants are able to be at the same table with landlords, where before that fight, you're not even at the table, right? You're, right. you're what's on the menu. Right, um, right, <laughs> right. And, and so, but once you get there, there is, there is a little bit of a contesting for power. There's a little bit of negotiation. There's a little bit of give and take, you know, because you're not at this place where now you run the agenda and yeah. uh, you know um, there's there's a need for compromise and there's a need for for that that kind of strategic deliberate you know work to to you know work within different stakeholders and and talk things out right um, so I think that's a lot of what we do is is you know we fight to get to the table and then often what sometimes folks who are who are in the power structure and maybe weren't able to kind of see a perspective that they maybe had a blind spot to find afterwards is actually they're pretty happy with with uh, you know that things were you know things were improved for the better for everyone mm -hmm. uh, that that equity for a marginalized group of people doesn't always have to mean that those in power are worse off that sometimes it that it can be liberating for everybody right mm -hmm. and so um, so something like Kellogg Park in Ventura. I think now the city's really proud of it, gets oh. to brag about it, and you know, right? Yeah. Um, even though there were folks at the time who were like, oh man, these cause people are giving us such a headache, right? Uh, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> that, is, that is a really good point because yes, the city leaders definitely do, are very yeah. proud of it. It is a really, yeah. it is a really great part, yeah. yeah. Um, okay, so let's, let's talk a little bit, but we already said, you know, um, every success does not, it just it doesn't emerge fully Fully formed. So, can you talk to us about some of the challenges yeah, that yeah. you've faced in your work? Yeah. Well, the last <laughs> few like, years have been full yeah. of a lot of challenges. Um, I mean, for for cause, I would say just the last five years have been the Thomas Fire. Uh, you know, the the kind of Trump years working with an organization that works with immigrants. Um, you know, the the pandemic. Uh, but I think the the Thomas Fire is the thing I would probably highlight the the most here. I mean, that was just such a huge, um, tragic and difficult time for everyone in this community. Um, and for us, I mean, we're not a disaster response agency. We're not the Red Cross, you know, um, and we didn't think of our role as to be, you know, be in kind of disaster response mode, but um, we work on immigrant rights, we work on farm worker rights, we work on housing, we work on environmental issues, and in this moment of this massive disaster in our community, all of those issues that we work on were being impacted. Um, you know, and it's a nonprofit, you get grants, you work on programs, and you have your work plans, and um, and it, uh, something like that happens, you have to throw it all out the window, mm -hmm. right? Um, and everything you were supposed to do is turned upside down, and, and um, you just have to respond. And so, you know, we had, um, you know, the community that we work with, you know, uh, probably farm workers. I mean, we had thousands of people out working in the fields under really dangerous, mm -hmm. you know, smoky conditions. Mm -hmm. um, you had our, uh, our base of often low wage workers who are often undocumented, um, you know, excluded from unemployment benefits. And so all of these people lost work from people who, you know, worked in the, up in the hills as domestic workers and housekeepers and landscapers, um, you know, where the, the fire was burning to people who worked in Santa Barbara and the freeway was shut down and you couldn't get there and, you know, hotels and restaurants to people who worked in the fields when, you know, um, the conditions were too dangerous to work um, and basically were excluded from the safety net, excluded from FEMA, excluded from unemployment insurance, Right, um, you know, had housing stock being demolished. Uh, you had, you know, environmental issues that um, were not necessarily being communicated to people. You know, notices being put out only in English about things like, you can't drink the water <laughs> because right. the water is unsafe to drink, and it's, yeah. this is only going out in English. Right. Um, 
and so we basically had to respond in all these different areas and and um it was a hugely stressful time i think for everybody right um but you know we were able to work with some of our partners like uh my cop and fla distribute thousands of N95 masks out in the fields and the community um, to start the 805 Undocu Fund, which raised you know, over $2 million in, in um, financial support for people excluded from the safety net because of their immigration status. Mm -hmm. um, did a lot of um, you know that kind of language access you know to emergency information for our communities and ultimately I think it was really transformative in policy. I mean the aftermath of the few years after that, um, you saw you know county hiring you know Spanish speaking public information officers. You saw you know a couple different state bills that came from our state legislators about you know language access and culturally inclusive you know uh, emergency planning. Um, you know Cal OSHA passed like worker safety standards for wildfires and outdoor workers. Um, you know, the the state has begun to try to start kind of piecing together some some more of a safety net where the federal government is is not providing a safety net to to immigrant families and, and there's this much broader campaign called Safety Net for All that's that's kind of pushing for that. And so there's all these really incredible things that happen in the aftermath. But when you're in it in the moment, I mean it just feels like you're you're just um, way too small, right? Mm -hmm. And and way too unable to compensate for the shortcomings of government, the shortcomings of like systems that are intentionally excluding, mm -hmm. you know, thousands and thousands of people in our community from the most basic support during a just huge disaster that's impacting everybody. Um, and it feels incredibly overwhelming and stressful. And it's a real strain on organizations and it's a strain on, you know, your sustainability and the people who are in that work and everyone's burning out, right? And, and it's, it's hard to kind of keep going, right? Yeah. <laughs> Well, just talking to you about it sort of takes me back there. Yeah, you can you can like smell the inside of an N95 Absolutely. mask, right? I mean, that's the that's the thing that the the memory that most comes to my mind is that smell, right? It's a very distinctive. Absolutely. Okay, so you do really, really, really tough work. So when you are feeling, you know, I don't know, like you're tilting at windmills, right, and not make you're not able to move things forward, what do you do? How do you take care of yourself, and how do you get yourself back? Yeah, to yeah. prepared to fight the fight or whatever, you know, yeah. make the difference. Let's say a few things, um, you know, one, I just, we're, we're lucky to live in a beautiful place. So sometimes I just go to the ocean and, you know, get some, get some fresh air to clear my head. Um, I think it really helps that we've got an organization with a lot of camaraderie and none of us can really do this alone. And so, you know, having, having an organization that's made up a lot of people, both staff and non-staff, who are able to kind of pick up the slack for each other when when one person just is, is feeling burnt out and need, needs, you know, to take some time, I think is really important um, to remember that it's it's not just you in the in the work. Um, I think another thing that I really try to remember is, you know, for us, it's never about any particular policy victory. Um, it's never about any particular program or this park or this bus line. I mean, it is, right? And those are really tangible, concrete things. And it's it does help keep me going to go walk down to Kellogg Park and be like, that park would not be there if not for the sometimes grueling work of our organization. Or that bus line is, you know, there because people fought for it just like this. Um, and, you know, sometimes it felt like the odds were stacked against us. But I think more than those concrete victories, it's about the people built during the process, right? It's about the people power, about the leadership development, about the people who have that moment that clicks in their mind when they see, you know, this, this is about something bigger than me and I am actually more powerful than I thought I was. Um, someone who's a, a young person, a, a farm worker, a renter, a housekeeper, um, who's thought of themselves as someone whose voice didn't matter, um, who all of a sudden is able to see that moment where they're in the room with 50 other people just like them. And, you know, they see the people up on the dais and they're looking kind of scared of them. right? Yeah. <laughs> and, yeah. and they're like, wow, we're actually powerful. Um, and that transformational moment, even if you end up losing the campaign in the end, that transformation can't be undone. And that, that leadership development of that person is almost the outcome more so than the, the law you pass, the ordinance, whatever, the program. Um, the last thing I think uh, for me is is I'm I I'm a total history nerd and so I I like to view things in the in the grand scope of history and so um, you know sometimes when I'm feeling really burnt out or frustrated in, about what's happening in this moment I like to you know <laughs> crack open my history books and and uh, and and just read a little bit and I think it's both 
remembering that perspective of like, okay, what's really going to matter in the 50, 100 year scale, um, but also remembering how far we've come, right? Mm -hmm. And that there are, um, you know, there are so many parts even of this, this community here in Ventura County where, you know, uh, 100 years ago, you know, someone like me wouldn't have even been able to like buy a house here or, you know, be, be in this place or, um, you know, that the, the level of inequality along racial or gender or economic lines was so much greater. Um, and yeah, where, where, you know, people in say the, the Chinatown right here next to the museum, right, were yeah. facing just extreme, extreme persecution, right? Um, that puts it into perspective of all the people who kind of fought before us in often much worse conditions than we're fighting, right? Who, who risked their lives and, you know, had death threats against them and, and all of that. And, um, who you know are are the giants that we're standing on the shoulders of right mm -hmm. um and that we owe it to them to keep that up right mm -hmm. and to continue that fight and keep that um you know train of progress moving forward oh I, I i love that i think that that's one of the reasons that the museum is so involved in celebrating the 150th anniversary of ventura county is you know it's great to celebrate and everything it's great to have something to rally around but it's really that i think most of us walk through life feeling like it's always been this way and it always will be yeah. this way and and you know we both have kids and our kids are growing up vastly different yeah. circumstances than what we grew up in and just in the most simplistic ways and you know it's it's not, it hasn't always been that way. It won't always be that way. And you're not just sort of riding along the waves. It's not this way anymore because people just like you exactly. worked to make it different and you can ch change the future. You will change the future. Exactly. And, and, and to help people see themselves in that history, I think is really valuable and powerful. Exactly. I think we can get sucked into the trap of inevitability in two directions, right? you can get to feeling like everything is inevitably crappy, right? <laughs> you know, you can feel like hopeless, that nothing will ever change, you know, for the positive and, and all of the problems that we deal with are just, you know, going to be here forever. And you can get sucked into the trap of inevitability of, you know, everything is going to keep rolling yeah. forward and we're, yeah. everything is just naturally uh -huh. getting better and no one needs to uh -huh. do the work to make it better, right? Uh -huh. It's just, it's just, you know, things will come with time and we just let it, got to let it work itself out, right? Um, and the reality is like, neither of those things are true. They're both, you know, they're both false stories. Um, and that things have gotten better. Things have gotten so much better than they were, right? A um, hundred years ago, 200 years ago, right? Um, when you think about the work of emancipation of slavery, right? The, the work of voting rights, the work of, you know, um, all, of these, all of these things that we maybe take for granted now, and they were people who fought and died and shed blood, sweat, and tears to make that happen. Um, and yes, it's true that that work is not complete, right? Yes, it's true that if you look at, say, the median household income of people of color versus white people in Ventura County, there's still this huge mm -hmm. gap. You look at, you know, home ownership rates, things like that, right? Um, there's these, these massive gaps still, um, and that there's still people who are going to have to shed blood, sweat, and tears <laughs> to, to close those gaps and, and keep things moving forward. And 100 years from now, people will look back and say, wow, I can't imagine how bad things were in 2023 in Ventura County, <laughs> right? Yeah, right. <laughs> That's such a good point. Yeah. You know, one of the sort of themes of our talk, I feel like, is this pushing against sort of a binary narrative, right? Yeah. Good, bad, et cetera. And you said it a few times. It's yeah. like neither, you know, things aren't as bad as they were. They could yeah. be better. You know, you can't either fight or yeah. work within the system. And I really like that. And I think it's you know, it, it's good to remember that and sort of it gets to that, how yeah. you feel when you're feeling really down. Yeah, yeah it, okay, so things aren't always gonna work out, but yeah. some things are really gonna work out. Totally, totally. I mean, there's a, there's a, our world is built on a lot of binaries, right? Yeah. <laughs> you know, in yeah. our structure, you know, men and women, you know, uh, white people and indigenous people, you know, yes. uh, <laughs> right? Wh whatever the, the, you know, thing is, light and dark, you know, good and good and evil. And, and um, you know, I think that's maybe a little bit of generational change, right? I think a lot of younger people are seeing the world as more spectrums, more shades of gray. And, and um, yeah, I think that's a, that's a change for the better, you know? Yeah. And it's a fight against simplicity. Yeah. Life is not simple. Yeah. And, and it's, it would be nice yeah. sometimes if yeah. it were a little simpler, yeah. but it's just not. Yeah. Absolutely. All right, let me look at, let me make sure, what else do you want to talk about that I have not asked you about? No, yeah, that's a good question. I, I, can, I those. want to ask you about what cause is working on right now. Sure. And then I also want to say, you know, we're talking about the past 150 years of history. What do you, what would you 
what do you see in the next 150 Ooh, years? Right. Okay, that's a big question. But or maybe you can just answer it from a cause perspective. Sure, sure. All right. So, um, what is cause working on right now? So a lot of what we're working on right now is around housing. Um, and the housing crisis has just kind of spiraled out of control to, to you know, really unsustainable levels. And in this community, I mean, really all over the world, but but certainly here in, in Ventura County and um, for so many, you know, people who are renters, right? And maybe will never be able to have the, the you know, wealth building of homeownership or are struggling with, you know, the rent rising every, every year. Um, it's forcing, you know, multiple families to live in one apartment, you know, especially a lot of our community are like farm workers and, uh, you know, lower wage workers. Um, you're seeing people be displaced out to, you know, even as far out as like Kern County and, you know, or even moving out of state. Um, and, you know, people having to devote so much of their income to rent that they're not able to afford other just basic necessities, right? You know, they say the rent eats first, mm -hmm. um, you know, sometimes before your family can even buy groceries, right? Um, so we've been doing a lot of work around strengthening tenants' rights um, and, and working to uh, increase the um, protections for tenants against unfair evictions and extreme rent increases, uh, you know, at the at the city level, um, at the state level. Uh, we've also been been working uh, on how do we address also the long term, right? The tenants' rights is a little bit of how do we keep people sheltered through the storm, right? Mm -hmm. um, and then part of the long term is how do we get affordable housing built? Um, and how do we get funding for it? How do we get it permitted? How do we get it on the ground? Um, and you know, that's the work of you know, many years, but um, doing some great collaboration with some of the affordable housing builders in the county and kind of you know, looking at how to, how to make that more possible. And, and um, so it's a, I mean, housing is in so many ways, it's like at the, one of the core things in terms of racial inequality that's that's always persisted right um you think of some of the the worst like racial covenants and mm -hmm. and you know redlining right mm -hmm. um you know that those legacies are still still with us even if those mm -hmm. you know uh those laws are no longer in effect um you still see this massive gap in homeownership rates and things like that right and so we see that as, as part of the continuing work of kind of undoing that, right? And, and making sure that everybody deserves shelter, everybody deserves a roof over their head. Um, and that's so core to people's health and economic well-being. Um, so, so that's a lot of our, our focus right now. Okay, so I'm gonna ask a different question. So one of the, another reason that the museum is, this is not for the video, but just to give you some context, another reason that the museum is so involved in the 150th mm. anniversary is that we do consider this the launching point for an ongoing organization structure, loosely yeah. organized group of people that I call Ventura County Advocates mm. that are working on a, a variety of different levels to you know, make Ventura County a better place. Mm -hmm. um, that's that's as far as I've gotten. Uh, and I picture it as a, a as a as a set of, in my mind, it's it's made up of equal parts of um, leaders and legends and what I call fighters, mm. right? Um, because everybody has to be at the table yeah. together, otherwise you're on the menu, as yeah. you said. Um, and I guess you know we are at this moment. So here I get to my question. We are at this moment in time. If you were to if you could guide the conversation about the fight hmm. that this county could really make a profound hmm. difference in, where what do you think it should be? Should it be housing? Should it be bigger than that? Hmm. What, do you, what do you see? Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, there's there's so much um, that needs to be done. It's hard to to say where to start. And I, you know, I'm, I'm reluctant to say kind of one issue or you know, but I think something that's been central for our work um, and something that I think is central to kind of some of the identity of Ventura County is around agriculture and kind of the the well being of farm workers. Um, you know, I think that you look at some of the earliest kind of political struggles in this this county's history things things like the Japanese Mexican labor alliance and this like 1903 strike of you know sugar beet workers right and um, and that's that have defined you know things in our our county's history i mean you know a lot of the other issues we have certainly we have housing issues as do so many other communities right certainly you know we have environmental issues as do so many other communities um, but Agriculture here is something we've played such a big role in history, from the founding of the first multiracial farm worker union in Oxnard yes. to, you know, Cesar Chavez before he started the UFW, you know, working yes. in in Oxnard. Yes. Um, you know, these are 
these are places where Ventura County has actually shaped the course of U.S. history, right? Um, and and that's that's really incredible. And so I think, you know, if I was to think of a place that would really be transformative, that would make me feel like, you know, Ventura County is is moving forward, right? Um, one of the things that makes me feel like Ventura County is is stuck in the past is, you know, when I'm like out looking out in the fields and, you know, it is dark skinned people with backs bent, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. doing hard labor mm -hmm. in land owned by, mm -hmm. you know, affluent white folks, right? Yes. And yes. if you were to, you know, rewind Ventura County to like the mission era and be like, look at that same exact spot, right? You would see almost the same image, right? Yes. Um, and so how do we, you know, undo the the kind of, you know, kind of colonial power structure in some ways that we still live with, right? Um, and agriculture is always going to be a part of Ventura County's identity, and I think it needs to be, right? You know, that's, we want this to be, everyone wants this to be an agricultural community, right? And how do we do agriculture in a different way? How do we do it in a way that uplifts people in a different way that, um, you know, interacts with uh, race and immigration and history in a different way that um, interacts with our environment, our natural world in a different way. Um, and I think there's a lot of people that would need to come together to make that happen. But um, to me, if there's going to be something really transformative in Ventura County's identity, that's going to say we are going to be fundamentally different 200 years from now than we were 200 years ago. Um, that's it. That is, I think it's actually brilliant and elegant too, because if you think about SOAR, right? right? right. And we have like this, this group of people, affluent yeah, people, yeah. you know, in power, yeah. who have created this sort of value around yeah. agriculture yeah. and it's a way in. Right. I think, I, I love that idea. Right. We're gonna do that, Lucas, yeah. let's do that. I mean, everybody's got, you know, the environmentalists, you know, have a, have a stake in it. Yes. You know, the business sector has a stake yes. in it. You know, labor and workers have a stake in it. It's, it's just, everybody's got to figure out what is the way to make agriculture sustainable for the future, but also, you know, also different, right? Yes. Not, not just we need to preserve, which is sometimes what's thought of in yes. things like SOAR, right? It's like, right. let's preserve, let's keep things looking the way they are, but you know, no, maybe the status quo is not that great. And maybe actually there's things that need to be transformed. Right? Yes, yes, so. yeah, I, I, that's fantastic. All right, one last question. Um, you know, this is interviews with innovators. And if you were talking to a 13 year old you, right? Yeah. And who was interested in, in doing something sort of groundbreaking for your community service project when you were in eighth <laughs> grade, um, what, what advice or guidance would you offer to upcoming innovators and yeah. people who want to change the change the world? Yeah, I would say to look for the folks doing this work and plug in and don't be afraid to do the hard, sometimes grinding work of organizing the unorganized. Um, and when I say organizing the unorganized, I think there's it's it's easy to connect with the people who are already politically involved, already you know active. Um, but that's like 1% of the population, right? And 99% of the population is, is, you know, most of the time pretty, I wouldn't say checked out, but, but you know. Occupied. Muslim, yeah, occupied, maybe even disempowered, right? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, feels like their voice doesn't matter. There's nothing mm -hmm. for them to do, mm -hmm. um, you know. And I kind of had a choice that I made when I was younger of, you know, I thought, okay, maybe I was drawn to like, you know, going to DC or doing some, you know, something there that you see on TV and seems glamorous and seems flashy and, you know. Um, and, you know, when I found I did a, did a semester in Washington, D.C., I hated it. It was, yeah, you know, yeah. it was not not for me. Uh, you know, didn't like wearing a suit all day. Didn't like, you know, the the kind of networky kind of pecking order kind of stuff there. And, you know, um, and, you know, feeling like what I think some people want to do when they're drawn into kind of political or social change work is like, let me gravitate towards power. Let me gravitate towards where the kind of magnet of power already is, right? Whereas yes. I think the, the more important thing to do is look at where there's not power or maybe where there's untapped power, right? Where there are a lot of people who actually have a lot of people power, they just don't realize it yet, right? Um, and how do you go out and talk to those people and like, don't be afraid to like pick up a clipboard and get your hands dirty and go out and knock on doors and do the stuff that I think sometimes people feel like they're too good to do, right? Of organizing like the, mm -hmm. at the grassroots level and they're like, oh, I want to be in policy and I want to be, you know, mm -hmm. calling the shots and, you know, talking to important people and I want to talk to the, the congresswoman and you know um, but I think the the real power does start at the grassroots level and that's where the more transformational change happens and so 
I would say, you know, get plugged into an organization that's doing that work of organizing the unorganized and go out there and, you know, be willing to, to you know, spend some time in the trenches, right? And, and do the work that might feel unglamorous or might, you know, feel slow, right? Um, because true change is slow and it's, you know, undoing, you know, centuries of <laughs> power inequities is very slow and, and you have to be patient and you have to be willing to, to, you know, organize block by block, person by person. I, I love it. Well, thank you. I mean, honestly, this has been inspiring and enjoyable and I'm just so happy you're here. I'm so, so happy that Cause brought you back. We're very lucky to have you and thank you. Thank you for having me. I'm really honored.